Hoy vamos a hablar con Hannah Rose. Hannah es editora, es directora de arte, es diseñadora de juegos, ha hecho un montón de cosas en el mundo de los juegos de rol, ha colaborado en los proyectos de Critical Role, por ejemplo, en sus manuales, ha trabajado para Wizards of the Coast, la editorial de Hasbro que publica oficialmente Dungeons and Dragons y ha participado en un montón de proyectos. En esta entrevista vamos a hablar de qué hace un editor, qué hace un director de arte, cuáles son los desafíos, qué cosas podrían cambiar, cómo ve que viene la industria, el rol de las mujeres dentro de la industria, el rol de nosotros desde el sur global, ahí se le paga bien, se le paga mal a la gente y muchas cosas más. Así que quédate ahí y mira esta entrevista con Hannah Rose. Hannah. Among the many things you've done in the TTRPG industry, you've worked as an editor for several projects, right? Arcadia, the Taldoray campaign setting Reborn, Journeys through the Radiant Citadel, Call of the Netherleap, and many, many more. There is a lot of things you've been involved as an editor, as a designer, as an art director, a lot of things. Talking specifically about being an editor in the TTRPG industry, What does an editor do? I mean, if we have to explain to our, our audience or people that don't know what happens behind the scenes, what does an editor do? So I usually break editing into three categories. Um, an editor on a project might do more than one of these, but the first is developmental editing. So that's uh, looking at the design um, and structure and consistency, clarity, all of that. So for, for example, for an adventure, um, I'm looking at, does this give the, inf does this give the game master the information they need in the order that they need it? Um, Are there any weird plot holes? Is there stuff that I think the GM really should know that the adventure isn't telling them? Like, um, is there stuff that I think the players will really want to do that the adventure should allow for? Um, is it being too restrictive? Is it um, so open-ended that we're kind of leaving the GM to flounder? That's something that, you know, any, any pre-written adventure or material for a GM, there's a certain amount of improvisation expected. Um, but what I really keep an eye out for is, are there things that the GM would expect or hope the adventure to have that it doesn't and it would be a moment of like frantically flipping through and being like well what are the rules supposed to be for that and if there aren't any rules or they aren't you know referred to um then we're just leaving the gm to we're just setting up pitfalls for them um so that might be like well if there is a trap um and um it says like somebody who fails You know, trap, there's a DC 15 dexterity saving throw uh, to avoid the trap in this hallway. But the material doesn't say, and, and on a failure, they take 2d6 slashing damage. Uh, but the material doesn't say what they're taking the damage from, then that's the kind of thing where it's like, we're leaving the GM on the spot to make that up. And sure, GMs make stuff up all the time, but there's no need to leave the GM to do that. Or if it says, you know, there is a line of fire here and, you know, the characters have to pass through that, um, then we want to tell the GM, does this fire, there goes the cat, does this fire damage the characters? Does it, you know, can they make a, uh, a check to jump over it? Um, can they try to put it out by magical or non-magical means? Um, so developmental editing is a lot of that. Um, you know, sometimes higher levels, sometimes looking at very specific things, um, mechanics, wording, you know, should this be a bonus action or can this only be once per turn? Um, and so that's usually, it should be earlier in the process. 
Um, and then there is copy editing, which is looking at, again, for clarity and consistency and order, but digging more into the um, line by line, whether that's prose or mechanics, making everything flow smoothly, sound good, um, matching the D&D style um, so that it is consistent and correct and um, clear. That, um, and uh, then there is proofreading, which is catching anything that slipped through from any of the above. Wow, that, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I think a lot of people think that editing is just checking for grammar and typos. <laughs> um, and that is really not even the tip of the iceberg. So do, uh, do you do this in, in a team or usually an editor is alone? Um, depends on the project. So often it's in a team, it's, you know, or as part of, as part of the process. Um, ideally, a project would have two or even three different editors for those different phases. Um, proofreading something you've already edited is just really not fun and it's good, good to have fresh eyes on something. Yeah. Um, proofreading is very hard in general, but, but it's really good to have completely fresh eyes on something um so for example for arcadia um on earlier issues of arcadia i acted as a copy editor and james intracasso the managing editor commissioned the articles and worked with the authors to give developmental feedback and refine them um and then after seven or even eight drafts of feedback and playtesting and revision, um, it would go to copy editor um, and um, I or another copy editor would go through it with more of a fine tooth comb um, in more detail. And sorry, I'll try to try to cut down on the idioms. Um, I don't oh, know if that would translate. Um, go through it in more detail and really polish it, make it sound great, um, catch anything that hadn't been addressed, get all the mechanical wording clear. And um, then the, at MCDM, the playtesters actually act as proofreaders, which is amazing. Um, and so you get many people looking it over. Yeah, that's amazing. That's many eyes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's really good. So I, I would like to, to ask you what you uh, we mentioned many of your the, the works that you edited. So what would you say is the greatest satisfaction of edit editing these kinds of projects? And what are the main challenges about yeah. being an, an yeah. editor? Um so the satisfaction during the work is absolutely taking something that is cool and making it better you know that it's very much iterating and collaborating and so like yes sometimes that collaboration is very active sometimes it is going back and forth with the author you know when i was managing editor of arcadia then i was doing the developmental part with the authors and overseeing other copy editors um so the, whether it's active collaboration or just me sitting alone at my desk looking at the document, it's um, working with something that is already there to really bring out the best in it and um, polish up uh, any rough edges, make things that um, make it shine, make it really... Um, ready for people to enjoy and use and have the most fun with. Um, which brings me to the second part that is very fun and satisfying, which is hearing the stories that people tell about it. I mean, that's not just for editing, that's for anything I've worked on, but um, that's one thing I really deeply love about working in on TTRPGs is that it's, there's such a, close relationship and such a transformative relationship with the audience that it's not just 
I make something and people engage with it passively or play through a set story, um, it's they take it and cut it up and mix it up and, you know, tell their own stories. Um, and I love hearing about those. And, and what would be the, the main challenges? Oh yeah, and the, the main challenges, oh, um, yeah, <laughs> let me, let me kind of figure out how to sift through it, um, it is, it's very subjective work in a lot of ways. There are certain things that are objective, you know, grammar, um, to some extent, D&D style. One of the challenges there is figuring out, okay, this mechanic is supposed to work this way. And I, as a player or a GM, understand that. Is there precedent for how this should be worded or formatted? Um, so making it consistent with other published material, or saying, okay, well, this is the way Wizards of the Coast is wording it in their latest books. So they think that way is good. Um, so I'm going to match that. Um, you know, whether or not I'm working on something for Wizards, that, that you know, tends to still apply. Um, so finding that precedent, it's a lot of engaging with the existing material, which is fun, but also can be challenging. Um, I dearly wish D&D Beyond had a better search function, maybe someday. Um, and, yeah, um, it is, it is subjective in that I have to, you know, I'm working off of my instincts and experience to say, okay, here is what I think we need to tell the GM, or here's the order I think this information needs to be presented in. Um, but... I have to decide, is this important enough to bring up to the designer or the project lead or make this change? Is this just kind of a personal preference thing or are there pros and cons both ways? And um, do I want to, you know, do I want to suggest that and let the lead decide or do I want to not bother the lead about it? Um, or do I want to make a call and put in the change and if the lead doesn't disagree, then they don't have to accept it. Um, so, yeah, the, the subjectivity makes it very creative, uh, but it is also a challenge. I was thinking about that. It, it's, it seems like it, the entire show is a challenge. Like, you, you're sitting uh, in front of a document that is not complete, uh, and you have to, like, make everything work. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 everything seems like a challenge. So I mean... I love designing too, but to me, it's usually less challenging than designing because <laughs> designing is like, you know, every single word has to come out of my brain. Uh, it's not already there on the page to iterate on. Um, so uh, I, I want to go to, do, 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 you, do you feel that you have a, a bird's eye view of the project you work on? Like, like how does your view on the project is mm. different? from the other people that are working on it? It depends on the project and what context I am given, right? Um, and what kind of editing I'm doing. So ideally, I like to have as much information as possible. Um, in some ways, that is more work, but it also means I can do the best possible job. You know, if I know the full context of the project and the audience and if I'm editing, for example, one adventure in an anthology, um, then, you know, being able to see and compare with the other adventures. Or if I'm editing a, you know, ongoing adventure, then I might not be editing the whole book, so I'd like to know what happens before and after. Um, or, you know, if it's set in a, in a certain setting, I want the information on that setting so that I know what information the DM is already being given and what, um, you know, where to refer to that or what information they might not have yet. And also make sure it isn't outright contradicting anything. Um, 
So I try to get as much context as possible. The, many of the things you are saying, this uh, working with other people, working in projects where you have a, a bird's eye view and working on projects where you have just a little peek about, about the whole thing. In past interviews, um, bear with me, I, I'm yeah, going yeah, yeah, okay. to talk about today. I, I want to, to, to get the 2023 HANA to answer this, this question. In past interviews, for, for example, with uh, Peter Atkinson in the uh, Gen Con YouTube or, or with Destis and Dragons, you mentioned how your uh, background as a software, software uh, developer uh, influenced your view on, on designing RPGs. But now you are a, a successful uh, editor and designer uh, with many uh, books in which you have worked. So now that, that you have worked a lot in this industry, that you have experienced how working in this industry really, really works. What's different? I mean, uh, what difference? What difference are there between the the software development industry and the TTRPG industry? Well, first of all, I'm so flattered that you went and watched my other interviews. I don't think I've ever had somebody be like, oh yeah, we've watched all of your other interviews and we want to, you know, compare that. So I'm wow, I'm very flattered. Um, that's a great question. I think the relationship, I sort of touched on this earlier, but the relationship to the audience and users is different. You know, in software, the audience varies you know, very widely, um, you could be making tools for your team to, you know, another team at your company to use. You could be making tools that other companies use. Um, you could be making a website that anybody can use, but you know, you have a certain target audience for. Um, you could be making things that, you know, other non-tech, that non-tech people use um you know mobile anyway you you know we all use we all use tech and software we get the picture but um and and many but not all of those audiences are usually very distant from you as a developer um there might be ideally there are product designers and user experience designers and researchers User experience researchers, market researchers, uh, people who, you know, get that feedback um, and distill it for the team. But um, you're not necessarily, you know, hearing from the audience directly or hearing um, that feedback, uh, hearing positive feedback post-release. Um, and that's something I really love about working in TTRPGs is making making things for people who are excited about them and use them to tell their own stories and together with their friends. It's just it's so collaborative all the way down. Um, the collaboration, I think, is something that the TTRPG industry actually has in common with you know, a good tech tech team and tech project is it's very collaboratively building something together and people have different responsibilities and specializations. Um, but, you know, you can go to other people on the project to bounce ideas off for help um, and or just to hang out and work together um, and, you know, put together um, what you're building. But you know, like I said, the end user is going to engage with it in a generally very prescribed way. And I don't want to sound down on that. Like, that's, you know, that's not a bad thing. But there is something special about role playing game work um, that people are using it at tables with their friends, you know, online with their friends all over the world to hang out together and to make something that is really unique and personal and it's it's it feels like an honor to be part of to be part of that and to be part of their stories that's amazing so 
so you you you've worked in many projects related to critical role to their world <laughs> so like explorer's guide to wildermount Taldorain camping setting reborn the call of netherdeep like all the major books <laughs> like uh, and that's amazing and uh, by the way <laughs> amazing work <laughs> what would you say that are the main challenges when when working with such a popular and established world it's following um, on, on previous questions yeah <sighs> i guess i've never framed it for myself even in terms of the challenges because the the things that are you know amazing about it all, always come first for me i guess i have to say it's like the I, I mean, you could say that the challenge is that it will be so closely scrutinized and the fans know and care about all of the details. But to me, that's one of the best parts. To me, that's 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 absolutely a feature, not a bug. That's uh, that's that's not a challenge. That's like a reward. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's wonderful to me that I can I can put in all of this detail and and care and know that it will be appreciated. Um, and even though, I mean, I, I guess part of the challenge is right. You are working with such a big body of, you know, actual play material um, that establishes a large amount of the canon in the world. Um, so that that is certainly a challenge. Um, and for Taldore, you know, writing stat blocks and refining stat blocks balancing okay this is the way it worked during the show with okay this is you know the way it needs to work for a publishable stat block um is is a challenge uh but also like because of the critical role team and community it is so much easier it could be because there are critical role transcripts there's Um, the amazing crit roll stats people, and you know, there's Danny Carr, lore master extraordinaire, and I have all of those you know, resources at my fingertips to um, to support that work. That that's incredible. Uh, I, I'm going to jump to another point of, of your career, uh, if I can. You also work as an art director. What does an art director do in the TTRPG industry? So I always, I have to say, I always feel so much imposter syndrome about being an art director because I am not a visual artist. Um, I like, I'm not. On on one hand, I'm very much not qualified to be an art professional art director because I'm not a visual artist. I don't have that training. You know, I don't have that. Um, training and ability to do it myself um but i fell into doing that for Teldor reborn um because as you can imagine the critical role art director um especially during the development of you know legend of vox machina and a bunch of other projects was very very busy and so as lead designers um uh and and producers james hake and i Um, also became the art directors and then, you know, as managing editor, um, putting together the physical book uh, and the layout and all of that was a big part of my job. Um, and that was amazing. That was just, I, I'm repeating words here, but it was so rewarding to work with all of these incredibly skilled, dedicated, excited, critical role artists who brought their all to the project, who, you know, knew the material inside out, um, who were so much fun to work with. And it, I, I am quite detail oriented and, um, I do have lots of opinions about, you know, layout and style and composition and all of that. And I've learned where I can to to shore up my lack of knowledge as a not being a visual artist myself. Um, so 
it's it's something where again the, the collaborative process of working with an illustrator to create a brief and um, say you know here is about what we have in mind and give enough direction that the artist has a starting place what I would say is a clear vision but isn't isn't restrictive right um, and that can vary from piece to piece and artist to artist um, for the uh, for example for the piece of in Teldora Reborn of the wild mother and the law bearer um, standing back to back holding hands um, that was one of the yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it up on screen too. But um, for for a visual, um, that was one of the first pieces I thought of for the book because I knew we were going to have a section on the gods. We wanted some full page pieces for a chapter opener. I was like, hey, lesbian goddess wives um, deserve some art. And um, so I had a pretty clear vision for that. But I also wasn't, you know, I gave the artist a good bit of description, but not, um, I wasn't saying like, use, you know, exactly these outfits and, and, um, exactly this type of landscape and exactly these expressions, you know, it, it was, it was, um, I believe the brief was like, they are, you know, involved like they are very dedicated to their own domains, but they're also in love. They're, you know, and Susanna Uzik, who's the artist, just completely knocked it out of the park, of course, uh, did a fantastic job of Up and Beyond. Um, so, so it's like that, and artists I've worked with for uh, Teltore and for Arcadia, um, that collaborative process of saying here's an idea and here's the material you know here's a here's some information about what this illustration is going to um accompany or um you know or, or clarify or represent you know the character the um the in-world location the scene um and collaborating in a really just fun way um, to bring something to life and create something on the page that's beautiful and vibrant and exciting and um, that is hopefully, you know, inspiring to the GM, to the reader and the GM um, or the player, like if it's a subclass, you know, trying to have a character that's like really interesting and cool and makes the reader go yeah i want to play this subclass like these vibes sound fun um and or and, and also like if it's something that the gm would see something that matches the material if it's consistent that they can then show their players um and say you know this is what this npc looks like or this is what the uh, entrance to the underground, uh, you know, lake fortress looks like, or what the library looks, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, first of all, a, a quick question. Do you, uh, this is something we've heard many times from from different people in different roles in the TTRBG industry, it's, it's something that perhaps we even us feel in some small little way as journalists. Uh, do you do you struggle with imposter syndrome uh, in general? I mean, have you have you evolved in the way you you uh, um, face that that small part? Because you mentioned it, uh, right? After I I don't even know if it counts. I mean, I guess it's like I said, it's imposter syndrome as an art director, but it's also just like the knowledge that i don't know if that counts because it's also just the knowledge that i do not have the normal qualifications um but i also know that i have gotten wonderful extremely gratifying objectively very good feedback on the both from the 
um, you know, both on the final product and from the artists that I've worked with. Um, so as a editor and designer, um, you know, it varies. We all have our insecurities and times when we're struggling. Um, I generally know that my work is very good, but, um, you know, the writing, writing is hard. Um, editing is hard, writing is hard, and it's something that, at least for me, is very hard to do in a vacuum. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about collaboration, um, and as an editor, even when I'm working on something by myself, there is still that, that collaboration, that silent collaboration. Um, I have some wonderful friends and colleagues whom I can go to and say, like, hey, what do you think of this sentence? Or does this make sense to you? Um, or are you, you know, do you know of a monster that, that works like this where I can find some precedent? And um, if I had to do it my, like wholly on my own without ever talking to anybody, I would struggle a lot more. So, um, but I think there's, I, I think there is this like idea um, you know, there, there's this myth of the lonely artist, um, who, who does everything on their own, um, and especially like the lonely genius artist, you know, who is tortured and, and, um, never talks to anyone and somehow magically turns out, um, you know, brilliant works of art, um, you know, whether that's visual art or writing or whatever. Um, so I have to remind myself that that's really not how it works for most of us. So you've worked in different projects, in different roles, and like you ju just said, with different people from the industry. Some really big names too. I mean, your name is getting really big in the industry. Allow me to say it. It, it, it doesn't sound right if you say it, but allow us to say <laughs> it. So um, with this uh, background, uh, and especially this this year, because to, uh, to, 2023 was the, the year that everything happened all at once in TTRPGs, from the OGL scandal to everything that happened in between. I, we would like to to know your your insights. Uh, where do you think the industry is, is headed? I mean, you, you probably think a little bit about this and you probably talk to other people in the industry about where things are going. So in in your own opinion, where, where are we heading in the DTRPG industry? Well, I want to sound very, you know, wise and uh, thoughtful, but I don't know. I think that there is a lot up in the air. I think that, you know, things always shift and change, but certainly, as you said, this has been a year of big shifts and changes, and Twitter has been a central communication hub for the TTRPG industry. Joining Twitter at last and meeting a lot of people was a big part of how I got started and um, began, you know, working and creating professionally. And as Twitter dies a slow-ish and extremely painful death, um, the industry and community is really going through a big very difficult transition um and so i know that it's going to endure it's going to continue um that you know it isn't the end of uh the industry of D, &D of indie projects of anything um, but I don't know how things are going to settle in the next six months, a year, five years. We have, you know, one D&D &D or whatever it is going to be called coming out in 2024, which will be somewhat backwards compatible, but we don't know is there going to be a license for that at the beginning or eventually. Um, there are other companies working on their own RPGs that are um you know have a huge variety um of rpgs some that are intended to be alternatives to D, D. um 
And so the way I see it is like the fleet that was um, very centered in D and D create the specifically looking at Dungeons and Dragons creators, that fleet broke up somewhat and began to disperse and um, people are trying new systems and uh, writing for new systems and creating their own systems and that's not a bad thing in any respect. Um, it's I don't even want to pass judgment on like it being good or bad that it's it's just that's what's happening and um and i don't know where those ships are gonna land or where you know what the, what the new fleet will look like um i i think that it's it is a transition period um but and and things aren't going to look the same but also things weren't the same in 2022 as they were in 2019. so um so i'm i am optimistic I, I, am, I am more than optimistic that there will still be opportunities and possibilities and places for people to create and thrive and um publish and tell stories um and also that there's still always a lot of work to be done in you know supporting creators and making sure they are paid fairly and treated well and given the respect and tools to succeed well you you said you you didn't want to sound so wise and everything but i think you failed <laughs> oh, I pulled it off. <laughs> Successfully failed. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. So, one of the works you edited it's Ancestry and Culture, an alternative to race in 5e, which won two any awards and deals with the problem of race and bioessentialism in role playing games. There have been several changes in the biggest names related to this. Do you think there's still more work to do in this area? I think there's... <laughs> I mean, I... Hey, sorry, my cat is trying to eat my mic cord. Nah. No. <laughs> um, Every cat does that. Yes. I, I think there is always work to do in educating designers and editors and audiences and just ourselves as people um and learning about racism and bioessentialism in fantasy and how we can avoid um falling into harmful tropes and stereotypes and um so yeah the, you know as with as with any good work it is um especially when it comes to you know civil rights that that work is never complete that work is ongoing um i do think there's been amazing progress and um that you know the the official D, &D material that's being put out now um has changed a ton in its treatment of race and ancestry for the better Um, and uh, both both the official D and D material and a lot of third party um, stuff um, it has it's it's very easy for people, especially online, to criticize and um, you know raise the bar and uh, poke holes and you know. Um, out but looking at the differences of the progress that's been made just in a few years is i think really wonderful and incredible and um you know owing to a lot of hard work by many people to educate themselves and others and 
um, make better design and better books. Um, and when I say a lot of hard work, uh, I don't mean shout out on social media. Of course, <laughs> of course. So uh, following this topic, uh, we can see some changes related to, to these subjects. For example, in the original Tandori campaign setting, goblins are described as vermin that breed faster than rats. But <laughs> in the following books, Wildman and Tandori Reborn, goblins are more developed and with a more complex history. Was this a debate when working on these books? No. Um, this was something that we knew uh, was an issue that happened with the original and uh, we wanted to change. That was, that, was, that was no debate, that was going in, that was one of the highest priorities, um, was to, um, to fix, even, even if it means retconning and changing lore, um, to fix things that were, you know, that were issues and, and make the book um, and the world something that uh, was that we believed in and that reflected this sounds so like I don't know corporate speak but that you know reflected our values and um and wasn't racist <laughs> um so yeah that wasn't a debate that was a priority we worked with some excellent consultants um to collaborate on that again a very collaborative process and a, working with cultural and sensitivity consultants isn't just a matter of sending the work to somebody and having them point out the things that are wrong. It's, it's not a, well, this is problematic and this is problematic and this is problematic. It is um, identifying, you know, things that, that aren't working or that are racist or um, otherwise insensitive um, is certainly part of it, but a good consultant will explain why. It's a lot of work for a consultant, first of all, like pay your consultants, man. That is so much just knowledge and expertise and emotional labor. Um, so a good consultant will explain why something is a problem and uh, often collaborate on finding a change or solution. So going um, back to a more general subject, the, um, by the way, the, this was really interesting to, to see because when we were uh, working on the interview, we we read a lot of your work and, and the work before you, you got to to critical role. So we really wanted to ask that, that question. But let's go back to a more general question. Um, by any means to measure success, most people would call you a very successful uh, editor, designer, etc., a member of the TTRPG community. I mean, you work for Wizards of the Coast, you work for Critical Role, two of the biggest names in the industry without any hint of a doubt. But how does Hannah, how do, how, how do you define success? Oh. I think to me, success is creating something that okay okay so in the most general terms success is creating something that meets my very high standards and ideally you know that that, that meets others standards um that people uh enjoy and engage with and use um it's definitely not about awards um you know especially when most awards are kind of popular vote kind of stuff in this this space um it's it's yeah i mean you've just like 
completely co completely um uh, inflated my ego but but i think a feeling of like success i have is when people are excited about something because i worked on it which is very like it's a lot of pressure um but and and it does make me sometimes people want me on a project because they want you know if refer, they want my name for advertising um but you know as, as i said before i love to make things that people are excited about and have fun with and use um so to me that is success there's also a very practical terms being able to make a living um off of uh off of creative work um and um yeah i mean in the most practical terms you know there are a lot of people who um especially as creators in a small industry um who others might say like oh you're you know super successful and and you've worked with this big name so that means that like you have a ton of money um and that's not necessarily true um it also does yeah yeah um yeah success is not necessarily commensurate with pay um but that's also something that i've been very passionate about and where we have seen immense progress in the last few years and just a, a little follow-up question in some of your past interviews you said or you thought about uh, the the software industry as your safety net you are By continuing to work in in the TTRPG yeah, I don't want to industry, go back. you don't want to go back. That's, I don't want to go back. Um, <laughs> never, and never also again. It, is, it feels like less and less of a safety net, you know, as it's been five years. Um, you know, I think it would be harder to go back. Um, I, yeah, it's yeah, it, it's technically there, but I don't want to go back. And um, you know, I have various other um i say securities and privileges that i've talked about i think in terms of me being able to go freelance in the first place um is that that allow me to feel comfortable continuing to do this um but um but yeah as as much as i enjoyed some of the work I did as a software developer, uh, I enjoy this so much more and find it so much more fulfilling. That's amazing. So I would like to ask you, what would be a positive change that you would like to see in the industry in the following years? Oh, I, <laughs> I would like to see TTRPG publishers and companies um really practice um smart business and budgeting. Um I mean we just touched on like pay and all of that and my firm belief of oh god I'm, I am hoping I am hoping this doesn't like ruin your comment section or anything but my firm belief is that if you are a company if you are running a business that in order to run that business well you must be able to pay people a living wage that doesn't mean that I expect small publishers to pay the high, you know highest rates in the industry doesn't I expect that you know they won't have to negotiate um and and you know be unrealistic but the excuse that well it's a very small industry and customers don't want to pay more and um you know people used to do this just as a hobby thing um is so stupid and destructive like if you can't pay people you you shouldn't run a business 
<laughs> that's not a business that um that's precarious exploitation um and it's i'm not saying it's easy you know it's hard and shipping um i mean inter- especially with an international audience shipping printing um you know distribution in particular is a huge challenge with physical products um and you know a huge challenge in general but um that business if you're running a business you got to figure it out and you are going to be more successful and get better make better things get better work when you pay people well that's just what it comes down to is that if somebody is being first of all you can afford the people who are the best you can afford people who are really good and they're going to do better work because they are happy and comfortable working on this you know on a project that they're being paid well for and can devote more time to um you know if you're you're paying somebody 5 cents a word then um they're going to need to spend as little time on it as possible in order to be paid minimum wage um so so yeah if you're paying somebody 15 or 20 or 25 cents a word um then they're just going to do better work um and enjoy it more and that's going to make everything everything better um so that's my belief is people i think i think in the gaming industry in general there's this idea that it should be um fun and not corporate and you know and and we don't want to like have it feel too much like um like you know big businesses and um oversight and you know too much structure we want to be you know creative and and fast paced and relaxed and fun and I mean everything in moderation uh but again if you're going to run a business well you need to learn to run a business well and sometimes that means having structure and processes and budgeting and procedures and um and I see it in the industry go this this resistance to um things that feel too traditional um you know uh but the best places to work for are places that could strike a balance wow <laughs> that that was incredible that's amazing uh, yeah uh the, the, the excuse you know like the hobby thing it, it feels it felt like something that it was say like 20 years ago we we are in a different world right now Yeah. Well, and you know the 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 we're absolutely in a different world and a different industry because 20 years ago people writing adventures for free con badges. Well, guess what? Those people were all white men who probably had partners at home doing the cooking and cleaning for them. And you know, they were doing it for fun and there's nothing wrong with that. There's you know, nothing wrong with 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 doing this as a hobby um but there is something wrong with doing it for free because that undercuts other people who can only do it um if they're getting paid and say that um having that diversity of creators um has brought so much to the industry and is so vital and wonderful. Um and I mean even just like for me one of the big hurdles for me was I don't say big hurdles but but mentally there was this mental block where I knew like I knew this was silly but it was like well my name is not Matt or Chris or James like can I be successful? <laughs> and when I was starting out there weren't you know when I was just starting out there were not a lot of female creators 
um, who were big names in the space. Um, in fact, there weren't really hardly any um, who were who were like doing D and D creation and publicly present, um, you know, and and um, visible. Um, sorry, I got a little sidetracked, but but basically. Like you said, it's it's not 20 years ago. It's not a hobbyist industry anymore. And um, if the only people creating are people who can afford to do so for free, then that's uh, at at best boring, um, and at worst, you know, discriminatory. Yes. Um, a, 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 and a there's quick... inflation everywhere. Products are going to yeah. have to get more expensive because that's the way it works. You can't say. We can't raise our prices uh, because common business sense says yes, you can, and you have to. Okay. Oh yeah. No, no. I had a, a quick follow-up question. Do, do you think um, there has been in in these past years you have been working on the industry there has been a a noticeable change in the reception to women or or non males? that I want to get, to get into the industry. I mean, do, do you really see that change from the inside? Because you, you worked. Um, I've been insulated from it somewhat um, by virtue of having already known a lot of people in the space when I started out and a lot of prominent men in the space when I started out that were mentors and I think to some degree like knowing those people was a level of protection for me um and that was just you know a weird sort of privilege um so I like I said I've been insulated from it somewhat um I think there are just a lot more non-men now and a lot more experienced non-men now and people of color who are providing examples and support and mentorship for each other. Um, and um, the there are also, you know, I will say there are also several wonderful white cis men who have been wonderful mentors to me and advocates um, for others. And uh, I'm not just entering the industry now. And so I don't want to I don't want to say definitively one way or the other. Um, it's always a struggle and I have still faced um backlash um and sometimes i can just laugh it off and sometimes it has a tangible impact um but um but absolutely there are just so many more uh diverse creators and that makes the space um so much more you know no pun intended, but so much more colorful so much um I, more welcoming because there is that that example and variety and i will say as long as we're you know as long as we're getting spicy here it it can get also very divisive um people you know the the uh, Say this in a not super weird idiomatic way people will um there's a lot of infighting and what i see is very much not constructive criticism um and uh that is difficult but i do think it is there is progress um and just having so many more diverse people in the space um when I look at, again, looking back at the difference, I think it is wonderful. It, it is, absolutely it is. So, going to the last part of the interview right now, 
uh, what would you suggest to people, especially from the global south, that want to start a career in the DTRPG industry? Um, first of all, the same things I would say to anybody, which is, you know, read and engage with really good, high quality material, develop an eye for that and um, figure out, like, like evaluate, I mean, you know, <laughs> critical thinking skills, critical reading skills, evaluate what makes this, you know, good, whether that's acclaimed or easy to use or uh, popular material. Um, what sets it apart, what's different, and emulate that, and, um, you know, create what is exciting and fun for you and collaborate with others. Find your peers, people who are also starting out in the industry, who you can, you know, collaborate with and chat with and support each other, because that kind of networking um, with people who are your direct peers is actually so much more valuable than trying to network with the big names, you know, not that if you don't, you know, if you have a chance to, to, you know, sit down and chat with or, um, you know, engage with or work for a big name, that's great, but is lifting other people up on um, that that reciprocal support on um, both just in the everyday and in referrals um, is really valuable in so many ways um, so find that network um, read and analyze things that are you know great role-playing game material and practice um you know recognize that you're always going to get better and um and strive for that um and in terms of in terms of looking at the global south um i feel like there are people who are you know so much more qualified than I to speak on that RPG, you know, Southeast Asia folks and Desis and Dragons, um, and all of you. Um, but if I don't know, if you want me to comment on it, I think I think again that community and looking at building up that community and the industry and not you know not tearing down um that that every industry has issues and this one certainly does um but progress is being made and yet it will never be made fast enough for some people um you know, I, and so I guess, you know, focusing on um, your own work and the progress that you hope to be made um, and not, not getting into a cycle of, of hatred with the thing you're, you know, involved in, like, I, I see people who are so angry and it's like, are you even enjoying this? Is this bringing you joy? Is this, is hating this part of your identity? Is it part of your social life? Um, so, um, yeah, and another thing I always say to people is like, that's been very important for me is to have a home game that's just for fun. That's just a private, not streamed game. Um, that's been so important to me continuing to enjoy it. Um, as a hobby and as a creator. So, what can we expect from Hannah Rose in the following months? I know there are NDAs, I know yeah. there are... Yeah, but uh, 
is there anything you're allowed to say? Yes. We are um, journalists after all. We have to yeah. ask. Okay. <laughs> um yeah, I have a lot of stuff under NDA. Um I have a few projects on um, a few independent projects that um may come to fruition be announced in 2024 with some other collaborators um and can't use about that maybe one for a somewhat non-traditional audience um or unusual audience and um I mean I'm also just exploring exploring what I want to do and the risk, risks I want to take um all right yeah. so hannah thanks a lot for the interview it was amazing uh, i personally learned a lot in this interview i uh, it was like leon always says and i will let him say it too such a treat to to have you here uh, well leon anything yes this, this was amazing like we 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 read your name in many pages <laughs> and having you here I'm talking to you. This was amazing, and there is, it's such a nice time chatting with you. So thanks a lot. Thank you all so much. Muchas gracias. Um, gracias. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just blanked out. Um, it, it was absolutely wonderful chatting with all of you. Um, this was a delight. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, talk to us this is huge we, we we always try to promote the industry in this part of the, of the world and and it's great to talk to a, an editor so so our, our audience can can learn about this and, and you were great so thank you again thank you